Um, our speaker is Dr. Julie Meachin from Des Moines University. Uh, she's been here before many times, but you may remember her best from last year because she gave a talk here last year as well. Um, so Dr. Meachin um, apparently did not know that she would be a fossil into paleontology until uh, her undergrad at the University of Florida, where she also where she got her bachelor's and also her master's. Um, she then moved on to earn her PhD at UCLA, uh, so very close to here. And um, that since then she did her postdoc um, postdoctoral research at um, Netflix in North Carolina. And uh, at this time she's a professor at Des Moines University and um, returning periodically to La Brea uh, to do research on um, large Pleistocene megafauna. Uh, but this isn't the only Pleistocene site where she's been doing work, and you'll hear about her other sites um, in her talk today. Um, I know from last year that some of you came away with really great questions that you might be interested in asking her today, um, or hearing about um, uh, follow-ups today. So thank you, Dr. Michin, for updating us today, and please give her a warm welcome. What my reason to tell you is that she's my academic little sister, and um, I'm also happy to have my academic big sister sitting in the audience today too, Dr. Wendy Bender. So, um, uh, I've done a little bit of work um, on uh, on a couple of sites, um, and so I'm going to move this from myself. All right. Um, so last time I talked to you guys mostly about natural trap caves. Um, I didn't want to give you the exact same talk. I wanted to give you a little update on all the work I've been doing. So today is going to be a little bit of both. It's going to be a little bit of natural trap caves and a little bit of Rancho La Brea carpets. And so um, we're going to repel into the Pleistocene because that's what I do in my cave at Natural Trap. Um, all right, here we go. So a tale of two fossil sites. Um, these are the two sites that I work on, one you guys are all intimately familiar with and one you may have heard last year about, but um, uh, I, don't, I don't think any of you guys have been there. Um, this, is a, this is National Trap Cave, so you can see some people down here. Um, this guy here in the yellow helmet, I don't know if you can see that, you guys probably all know him, that's Dr. Xiaoming Wang. Mm -hmm. um, so he came out to the site with me um, in our inaugural year in 2014, um, and the reason why he came out is because um, he is, it's really interesting, um, he was on my dissertation committee here in Los Angeles, because he's at the, at the Maine Natural History Museum, but uh, he did his um, master's degree um, at the University of Kansas um, with Dr. Larry Martin, or maybe it was his PhD, I don't remember, it's one of those. Um, so he was actually at Natural Trap Cave in 1985. Um, and so I asked him to come back out to basically help me and get everything set, so there he is. And then of course you guys all know about Rancho La Brea. So these are my two fossil sites, and the reason why um, I'm doing work at both of these sites uh, is because they're both late Pleistocene sites, um, where the fossil record is really excellent. So it's good enough to reconstruct the environment and long enough to actually see patterns of change through time, and that's what both of these sites have in common. Um, so this is sort of the guiding question for my research program and the kind of research that I do. How can we use functional morphology and fossils to examine patterns of environmental change from the Pleistocene to the Holocene? Which is a really interesting transition in Earth's history, right? There's a lot we can learn from that. Um, and of course, my favorite group to work on are the carnivores. Um, and here, I'm, I'm set because, you know, we've got way more carnivores than herbivores. And as it turns out at Natural Trap, um, the herbivores still outnumber carnivores, but um, it is somewhat of a carnivore trap as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, we do have quite a few carnivores at National Trap. Um, and the other thing that's really interesting about my work, you'll see this, um, you'll see this blue squiggly line here. This is actually the climate, and here is years before present on the x-axis here. So you can see that it's doing some crazy stuff. We got a lot of ups and downs, colds and hot. Um, here is that last interglacial period, um, right before we have that really cold spell um, called the Younger Dryas. And then this mm -hmm. big spike right here, that's the Pleistocene-Holocene transition. 
And you can see once we get into the Holocene, which is modern time, our climate has still those spiky things, but it changes much less dramatically than it did during the Pleistocene. And so this red box right here is the time interval that I'm interested in. So I'm interested in all of these climate changes within the last mm, 30, 40,000 years. Okay? So that's what I'm, that's what I focus on for all of my research and my questions. Um, so I'll break my talk down into three parts. Um, the middle part, if you were here last year, you probably saw, but it's actually the shortest. So not too much overlap between this year and last year. I'm going to first talk a little bit about the coyote work that I've done, and this is a culmination of work that I started back in 2011, and that I'm still continuing today, along with the help of all my um, Rancho La Brea radiocarbon dating grant folks. Um, and so I'll give a little bit of um, data on the coyotes from here. And the other cool thing is I'm working on them from Natural Trap Cave as well, so I'm going to bring it all together, and you'll see how coyotes um, make a really cohesive, cool story. Then I'll go over um, my natural trap cave site, just so you can see what, what it entails. And then at the end, I will talk here about um, some ongoing Pleistocene research, um, mostly that I'm doing at natural trap, okay? So you'll get a little update on that site. Um, so the first question that I was really interested in um, coming out of my dissertation work is, how did the megafaunal extinction affect the species that made it through the event, right? Um, we all think of the Pleistocene extinction event, at least most of us think of it like, well, there's a whole bunch of things that went extinct, but then there's a whole bunch of things that made it through, and they're probably exactly the same, right? But what we're finding out is that's not really the case. So even things that lived through the extinction event were not untouched by the extinction event, okay? So how did the extinction event affect this species in particular? The reason why I got inter interested in this question is because um, of, of here at Rancho La Brea, actually. Um, we supposedly have uh, a bunch of different dogs here, right? Um, and I've got some show and tell about the dogs, right, about halfway through my talk. Um, but what we know about living canids in North America, um, here's a coyote at Yellowstone, um, and we know that when they interact with um, the living gray wolf at Yellowstone, um, it's really not good for the smaller species. Dogs are really territorial. They really don't like another species encroaching on their, on their area. And the big guy is going to pick on the little guy. So we know that when wolves were reintroduced to Yellowstone in 1995, um, there was a whole incident of wolves chasing and killing the largest coyotes that were at Yellowstone. Um, and, and we have this record of behavior in modern animals. And so I thought to myself, well, in the Pleistocene, um, so there's a, there's, a, there's a casualty right there that was killed by wolves. In the Pleistocene, we have these bigger guys. We have dire wolves. So what, we got dire wolves, gray wolves here at La Brea, or we think we do. Um, you know, what happens to the poor coyotes? Like, they're just sort of really doomed, right? They got two bigger animals picking on them. So I was trying to look at this and see how these um, relationships interplay with the coyotes that we have. <coughs> Excuse me. Now the coyotes that we have at Rancho La Brea are a different subspecies. Um, they are Canis latrans or cut eye. Here is a modern coyote skull and jaw, and here is the skull of Canis latrans or cut eye from the carpus. Um, and so the question was, how were Pleistocene coyotes different than their living counterparts? Do we see any differences? Um, are they the same or have they changed? Um, and what effects did the, did the extinction event have on this species? So in order to ask, answer these questions, um, I looked at postcranial measurements um, from almost, uh, from many, many of the coyotes here at Rancho La Brea. And I also included some coyotes from a couple other uh, Pleistocene fossil sites in Southern California, McKittrick and Maricopa, um, and I took all these measurements on these coyotes um, and I threw them into an analysis. Um, but before I tell you what I found, I will tell you that a later paper I did, um, I decided to look at the jaws of the coyotes here. I wanted to know what differences there were in the crania. And I used the jaw because the jaw is actually a pretty easy structure to model as a 2D structure. A skull, you really need to do it as a 3D structure. There's so much going on there. But a jaw, if you just take a hemi mandible, so half of one, you can take 
2D images and you can place landmarks on them and you can actually get some um, ecological signal from those pictures um, with a fairly easy technique. So I placed some landmarks on these coyote jaws um, and then I put them into this test called um, Procrustes Analysis. So if you guys know anything about Procrustes, <coughs> anybody know who Procrustes was? Greek. Anybody a, a Greek scholar in here? Um, so Procrustes was the innkeeper um, and you went to his inn and uh, you laid in his bed and if you didn't fit, he made you fit, right? So if you're too big, he'd lock you off. And if you're too small, he'd put you in the stretcher. So you fit the bed no matter what. So this analysis is called Procrustes analysis and the reason why it's called that is because we take shape data, we take landmark data, and then we stretch these shapes out so that the sizes are the same. So basically we superimpose two shapes on each other so that they're the same size. And what we get is we get data about how shape changes while mitigating the effects of size. So we don't get um, data about who is bigger necessarily. We get data about how shapes are different. And this is the test that we're using. Um, now, let's look at some results. So for the postcranial data, um, I put them in two different colors, um, but if, if the colors don't uh, look right to you because you can't see colors very well, um, on, the, on the right side of the screen we have all of the coyotes that um, were measured that live post Pleistocene. So we have a bunch of modern coyotes right here. Here's the Southern California moderns. Um, here are other modern coyotes from different sites. These Holocene caves are about 6,000 years old, so these are 6,000 year old coyotes. And this is, these are all from Pit 10 here at Rancho La Brea. They all date to about 10,000 years before present. We may have a few outliers in there, but as a general rule, the coyotes in that pit are mostly Holocene, earliest Holocene. Now if we look back, here are the Pleistocene coyotes from Rancho La Brea. You can see this huge jump, right? They're much bigger. And then here are the uh, Pleistocene coyotes from those other two sites I mentioned. Um, and this is um, a measure of size. Femur circumference is a great proxy for uh, size of coyotes. You can see there's a huge difference here, and they are significantly different. What did we get with the jaws? We found something cool. So I know this looks a little messy, but I'll try to uh, interpret it for you. The symbols are up here. So pit 10, I analyzed as something different. Um, here are the Pleistocene coyotes, and here are all the other modern coyotes. I did not get jaws from those, uh, like those Holocene caves. Um, I was not able to do that. So here's what we get. So here are the blue uh, squares. These are the Pleistocene coyotes. This is what they look like. You can see they're pretty robust. They've got deep jaws. They've got pretty big teeth. So these are pretty big coyotes. Here are the modern coyotes. You can see them over here. They're much more gracile. And you can't tell from this picture, but their teeth are actually way smaller. They're much, much smaller than these guys overall. But then these pit 10 coyotes kind of fell in their own shape space for the most part, and they were really interesting because they shared features of both of these groups. So they had a very small grassle jaw, like the modern coyotes, but they had enormous teeth, like the Pleistocene coyotes. So basically what we've got is we've got um, tooth, tooth uh, evolution um, lagging behind jaw evolution in the size of these coyotes, which is pretty interesting. And we're looking at that today. So a couple other things that I noticed from these um, coyotes, here's the modern, and here are the Pleistocene. Um, these bars indicate uh, the relative shearing and grinding teeth. So red for shearing because they specialize on meat, green for grinding, they specialize on plants, vegetation, other small things. Um, and then this blue bar here is the anterior jaw depth. So um, if you want to square these up and see how they measure up, you can see that there is a huge difference in the grinding to shearing ratio of the modern versus the Pleistocene coyotes. So these guys are eating much more vegetation than these guys. Um, and then here we go. Um, the anterior jaw depth is much deeper in these guys. That's kind of cool. It's kind of interesting because in modern dogs, at least what we see um, from work done on modern dogs that catch big prey, is that they have much deeper anterior jaws. And that relates to how modern dogs actually catch their prey. So we know that cats suffocate their prey, right? And then they, they kill the animal before they begin to eat it usually. 
dogs have a different mode of killing prey. They chase their prey and they wear it down. And part of that process of wearing it down is some dogs will go in and they'll hit the prey on the rump with their face. So they basically go and they slap the prey and they come back. And then another dog will do it and they slap the prey and come back. And this wears the prey down and confuses it. But that motion of doing that uh, slapping with your face, that actually creates uh, a wider face. So the, um, the ones that have um, deeper jaws here um, generally are catching uh, more prey than the ones that have the shallower jaws. They're going to be catching smaller things. So we know that Pleistocene coyotes were different, right? But why? Um, we wondered if it had something to do with climate. Um, this was the first thing we saw. So here on the y-axis is that body size proxy, femur circumference. Here on the x-axis is mean annual minimum temperature. And the reason why we wanted to know minimum temperature is because there's this rule called Bergman's rule. And it basically states that the higher in latitude you go, or the further away from the equator, the larger animals get. And it's been thought to relate to uh, climate and body size, cold. So the colder it gets, the less surface area to volume ratio you want, because you want to maintain your heat, right? So we were using this premise to test whether if it was colder, um, if they were bigger. And when we plotted modern coyotes on this scale, actually we got a very slight correlation, but only 0.04 that was completely insignificant. So non-significant correlation between climate and body size in coyotes. And when we plotted the Pleistocene coyotes on there, there was no rhyme. So climate by itself is not the reason. Now climate could be indirect, right? There's all sorts of indirect climate causes that could be happening. Um, but what else is changing at the Pleistocene Holocene boundary? Well, in the Pleistocene, coyotes exist with many different competitors, many of which are here. And then they also exist with many more prey options. So there's a lot more meat in the Pleistocene. <coughs> so maybe it is a cascade, a trophic cascade with coyotes, uh, which seems like the much more reasonable option than just climate affecting coyotes without any other things in between, like plants or herbivores. All right, so how did the megafaunal extinction affect the living species? They have changed. They changed in size, hunting style, Possibly social structure. We're kind of looking into that now. We're looking into all these questions. Um, so they, they've changed a lot. And as we do more work on them, we're realizing they really changed a lot. So here's some preliminary data from our study um, to give you an idea of what we're looking at. The y axis is radiocarbon years here. Okay, so here's 50,000 up here. Here's today at the bottom. Um, this is um, delta N, or uh, the per, uh, parts per mil of nitrogen. So this is a nitrogen isotope. And um, the red line signifies the extinction event. Okay, I put that at 10.5. So it might be 11, 11.5, 11 something like that, but it's close to here. And what I want you to look at, here are all the pits. So you can see all those dots that are different color pits. Um, and I don't care that you know which pit is which. That's not the important part. Here's the important part. Look at that. After the extinction event, there is an entire new space for coyotes. There was only one over here before that. So this, these nitrogen values, what they mean, these guys over here with the higher nitrogen values are eating more protein. So this is more protein, this is less protein. So you can actually see after the extinction event they're changing their diet almost entirely, um, at least in terms of protein. And um, so over here, we've got a lot of megafauna that they're probably incorporating into their diet. Now, whether they're hunting or scavenging, we don't know. But we know that they have a lot more megafauna in their diet over here. And then over here, they're eating more small animals and more vegetation. So we do have some, um, now we have some chemical isotopes to basically verify what my morpho morphological data showed before. And then here's the carbon data. Again, the red line is um, the extinction event. Here's radiocarbon years. And this is the change in carbon data. Um, and you'll notice here um, that we've got a shift. 
So this is not as obvious, this shift is not as obvious as the nitrogen, but they're utilizing space over here that they rarely ever utilized before the extinction event. Um, and basically this axis over here with the high, um, high negative values, we have sort of a, a leafy diet for herbivores, and at the low negative val values, we have more of a grassy diet. Um, so we don't know exactly what these data mean yet. I don't want to present them like we have all the answers. These are preliminary data, and our team hasn't even um, gone over these really in detail. So you guys are kind of getting a sneak preview before we're even deciding what's going on. Mm -hmm. So some of the conclusions about coyotes um, is that extinction events don't occur in a vacuum, right? Even though coyotes didn't go extinct at the end of the Pleistocene, um, many other things did, and that affected coyotes' ecology. Um, they're all interconnected. And coyotes survived, but not without significant changes. And you know, in the future, um, we have all these coyotes living in cities now. There's this whole project going on with Ohio University looking at Chicago coyotes. They're like urban coyotes. They do cool things like uh, shop at Quiznos and ride the subway. So, you know, in a hundred years, we may have coyotes that, you know, they're adapted for doing many different things than they're doing now. All right, yeah. Coyote on the subway, I like that one. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so let's talk about coyotes um, from my other site. So this is, um, this is my site of Natural Trap Cave, and I'll go over the site in a little bit. It's about the same age. Um, and what you're looking at right here are three jaws from Wyoming, okay? The top two are from Natural Trap Cave, the bottom one is a living coyote, so this is a modern coyote here, and these are all scaled to be the right size compared to each other. This is a coyote that we found from Natural Track Cave. And yes, it is a coyote, and we know it's a coyote because we've done ancient DNA on it. So we have uh, mitochondrial DNA that tells us this is a coyote. You can see how much bigger it is than the living coyotes. Um, this is uh, supposedly a uh, Beringian wolf jaw from Natural Track Cave. And I say supposedly because um, I actually did the work on this. You probably remember it from last year's talk if you were there, but I, I threw all these jaws into an analysis and they came out as this wolf that was exclusively known from Alaska and the Yukon. Well, turns out we don't really know what's going on with the canids at Natural Trap Cave. We also don't know what's going on with the canids at Rancho La Brea. So I'm going to give you guys a little show and tell. Um, so what I did um, when I went back to the samples that I had measured for my analysis that I did in 2016, um, and I sampled, I sampled um, two troops from these two jaws that were both included in my analyses that I said, oh yeah, these are for sure wolves. These are Beringian wolves. Well, I sampled the, the, um, the roots, and I am actually sending them to Australia for ancient DNA analysis. My collaborator for National Jack Cave is there. Um, and hopefully within a few months, we will actually know what these are. Now, they may actually not be wolves. They might be coyotes. These are some big old coyotes, if they're coyotes. The other possibility is that they're very small dire wolves. But these jaws are actually smaller than I thought they were when I went back to sample them. And here's the show and tell. Maybe we can turn the light on at the front. Is this the foot? No, that's the one. They're behind the chalkboard. Behind the chalkboard? Just so you guys can see these things, so I want you to see what they look like, and then we'll go back to the, to the presentation. So here's my show and tell. When I knew I was going to talk about this today, I asked Gary and Ash if I could pull some specimens out and show you, and they said, sure. So I pulled three. These are all from the tar pit. This is a dire wolf, okay? So we know this is a dire wolf. Somebody's ID it as such. We don't have DNA at, at, at the tar pit, um, and that... You know, that's a struggle for us, but we deal with it. And um, we know that we, this is a dire wolf from morphology. Now, this specimen from pit 13 was identified as a gray wolf. And this is the gray wolf that is in the collection. Now, you're asking me, what is the difference between these two jaws? And my answer to you is, I have no idea. <laughs> okay? So this is identified as a gray wolf, this is identified as a dire wolf. The only difference that I can see in these two jaws is the size. 
And we know from dogs and DNA analyses of dogs that that means nothing. Size means nothing, right? We've got coyotes that are twice as big as modern coyotes. So here's our coyote from Natural Trap Cave, or not Natural Trap Cave, sorry, mm -hmm. Lorette Filabrea. And it's, it is smaller than this specimen for sure. So we're pretty sure this is a coyote, right? But that coyote jaw that I have from Natural Trap Cave looks more like this. Okay, so we know that size doesn't mean much. And so what we're trying to do actually is figure out what canines we actually have here. That little anecdotal story I told you in the beginning, um, no, not so anecdotal, some observational story about how wolves kill coyotes at Yellowstone. Well, that probably was the case for canids throughout their existence. And so we've always been kind of baffled as to how there are dire wolves and gray wolves coexisting here at Rancho La Brea, especially with the large number of dire wolves that we have. Um, why, do gray, why are there gray wolves here? Well, the answer might be maybe there aren't. So that's kind of what we're looking into. Um, and hopefully the specimens from natural traps will give us a little bit of an insight into that. So the question that I'm asking then is, um, are there gray wolves in Pleistocene North America? Well, we know for certain that they were found in Alaska and parts of Canada because we've done DNA on them. They are definitively gray wolves. But there are not very many sites south of Canada to suggest that there are actually gray wolves there until the Holocene. The only two sites that have any appreciable sample size beyond like a tooth or a metapodial are Rancho La Brea and Natural Trap. Those are the only two. So I am looking at these two sites. Um, we're doing DNA from Natural Trap and whatever we find for Natural Trap may have implications for Rancho La Brea as well. So we're gonna, we're gonna keep pursuing that. Um, and like I said, ancient DNA from Natural Trap Cave will give us a much better idea of what's going on. So there's the, there's the, the dogs in a nutshell, and they are a mess. Also, I'll give away a little bit of a study that we're doing. We've actually done the DNA on a dire wolf, and I'm not going to tell you what it is, but I'll tell you that it's not what we thought it was, and morphology is confusing for dogs. So I'll give, I'll give away that little spoiler. All right, Natural Trap Cave, um, so we'll talk a little bit about this fossil site. Now, if you've been here to my talk last year, you've seen this bit. Um, here's where Natural Trap Cave is. Here is the state of uh, Wyoming. You can see it on the map. It's a lovely square. Here's Bighorn County. Here's where Natural Trap Cave is. It's about, oh, I don't know, a mile and a half, two miles as the crow flies to Montana. But driving, it's a couple miles because you got to drive around a canyon. you got to do all this crazy driving to get there. Um, but that's where it is. Here's what it looks like as we go up to the site. It's really beautiful. It's big sky country, definitely a big sky. Here's the road down to the site right there. There's a little sign about it. So here it is. Now here is this grate, this rusty old grate over the site that so nobody can fall in. Nobody can get in there uninvited. Um, and that grate was put there um, in 1971 or 72 because someone almost drove their VW Beetle in there. They got like two wheels in and they had to winch them out. <laughs> so there you go. It's a lovely site. Um, this drop here is um, it's about 80 feet right here from the opening, which is about 20 feet round, to the bottom of the cavern, which you can see is enormous. It's at least the size of a football field in there. Um, it's large. So this is where we do our excavation. Here's the excavation pit down here. Most of that pit was dug in the 70s and 80s by the team from the University of Kansas and the University of Missouri that originally dug it out. And we're doing a lot of digging laterally in the cave. We still get great fossils. There's about 75 feet. There's another, there's another 10 feet here from the hole. There's like a little rickety ladder you have to walk down to get to this little ledge. Not fun. That's the worst part about getting in, actually. What? No. Um, so we repel it. That's how we get in and out when we ascend out. Um, here are the kinds of critters that we find. So some of them overlap with the stuff here at, at, at Rancho La Brea. We have the American lion. Um, we have bison here. We have the uh, yesterday's camel. So all those three are the same. Um, we do have some horses, including the things we have here at Rancho La Brea. And we also have a different horse called Harrington Hippus, which is a stilt-legged horse. Um, 
We have a couple different things here. We have bighorn sheep, um, and we have the American cheetah-like cat, Mira sinonix trumani, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, and we have actually found one short-faced bear in there, but um, not a lot. So that's one more overlap between here and there. Um, here's that big pit. You can see how big it is. Oh, there's Xiaoming again with his little, uh, his little yellow helmet. Um, this guy right here is about six five. So you can see that this big pit is at least nine feet deep. Um, we didn't do all that. You can see there's a ladder going to nowhere. That was an eight foot ladder that got filled in. So there's a whole lot of stuff below here that's all fill. So we dig out this way when we dig out. This is the kind of stuff we find. We find the kind of fossils we find here. They're not quite as in, as quite nice shape, um, but it's also a lot easier to dig these out. These are in this really silty dirt. So all you need is a dental pick and a paintbrush to get most of this stuff out. You don't need any solvent or anything. And if you're wondering what you're looking at, um, here's what some things are that I can identify just from sight and then all this other stuff is gone. So bone, 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 bone. <laughs> So we find these big clumps of bone at Natural Trap Caves, just like you guys find them at Rancho La Brea, um, but they're in a slightly different format without all the, the asphalt holding everything together. This is what they look like when we get them back and clean them. Um, you can tell that there's some color differences between them. This one looks mottled. This one looks pretty creamy white. Um, those color differences uh, are real. They indicate time differences. The mottled bones are Pleistocene, the creamy white ones are Holocene. We have lots of little things too. Um, lots of rodents, rabbits, small carnivores, some bats, not as many as you think. Um, and then we also have a whole bunch of other weird things that like birds and fish and frogs. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. All right. So that's a little overview of natural traps. Let me tell you about some of the research we're still doing at Natural Trap, um, which is pretty cool. So ongoing research at Natural Trap Cave, um, and here's some that we're doing on the megafauna. So you guys, has anybody ever seen one of these? You guys drive just a little bit further east and you see a whole bunch of them, right? Um, these are pronghorn antelope. They are a native North American antelope. They're not really an antelope, we call them an antelope, but they're their own thing. They're actually most closely related to giraffes and opopies. Believe it or not. <laughs> um, their, their diversity was much greater um, in the past. Um, they're related to things that had these giant slingshot nose, horns, and things like that. Um, some little tiny ones, and I think there were some little tiny ones here. Not very many, but like one or two things that let us know that they were around here. And if you know anything about them, you know that they are the second fastest land mammal on Earth. They can maintain speeds of about 60 miles per hour, which is pretty fast. So um, this comes from a talk that my collaborator gave at SVP on work that she and I are doing together. Pronghorn, pronghorn, why dost thou run so swift? <laughs> so if it were a race, um, here's all the animals and how fast they run. Um, Here's the cheetah, which is the fastest land mammal, and then here is the pronghorn, which is the second fastest land mammal. Um, and so, cool, there's all this diversity, but if we go back to, uh, if we go to North America, eh, that's it. Like, this, uh, this is a cougar, it's never going to catch a pronghorn. Why dost thou run so swift, right? What, what's going on? So. I already introduced this guy a little bit. This is the um, American cheetah-like cat, Mira Sinonix trumani, described from uh, Natural Trap Cave. So this is the uh, this is one of the only sites um, that this species is known from. Um, we know that it's most closely related to a puma in genetics. However, it has uh, post crania that really closely resemble the living cheetah from Africa. Um, so we think that they're very fast. And because of this, all sorts of people have postulated or hypothesized that one of the reasons why the pronghorn is so fast is because the American cheetah-like cat was driving them that way, right? So we call this 
right, the Red Queen hypothesis where, you know, the Red Queen keeps running, right? Somebody's got to catch, she's got to catch the, the thing that's going round and round, right? So they evolved to be fast because their predators were fast. So that's, that's the hypothesis. The problem is there's absolutely no evidence to suggest this whatsoever. <laughs> we have no evidence. This is just um, a just-so story, okay? However, we have been sampling both of these tacks at natural trap caves, and we have been running stable isotopes on them. And one of the things you can tell from stable isotopes is what animals are eating. So, uh, my collaborator Penny Higgins, who is an isotope geochemist, has sampled um, the wolves from natural trap or dogs from natural trap. She sampled the um, Mirasonomics, the cheetah from natural, natural trap, and then a whole bunch of different herbivores. And what she found, basically, was that the only carnivore-herbivore pairing that overlaps in both carbon and nitrogen is the American cheetah-like cat and um, the pronghorn antelope. So we think that cheetahs were actually also eating horses, so these guys overlap too, but they were almost certainly eating pronghorn, and nothing else was eating pronghorn that we know of. So, the only thing that was eating it was the cheetah, Mirasonotics, um, two little fasces. Um, and so, we've got a little bit more work to do on this before we can actually publish it. Um, our next steps are actually to acquire more pronghorn and cheetah samples um, in field work that will happen over the next two years. Um, we want to examine the pronghorn lineage. When did they get fast? Unfortunately, most of the signs of physiological speed are found in the soft tissues, like the heart and the lungs. But can we get some of that data from bone histology? So that's the next thing we want to try to do. Um, we want to do histological thin sections of extant pronghorn bones and compare it to, oops, compare it to the uh, nearest living relative, uh, the okapi or the giraffe. Um, and then once we figure out if they're any different, then we can go with some histological sections of fossil pronghorn to see if they show those same traits. So moving on from the pronghorn and the cheetah, um, we also have lots of other data from natural traps. We have a bunch of pollen, which is really cool. In 2015, we collected over 200 pollen samples and analyzed approximately 60 of these, and they give us some really great data. From those 60 samples, we actually now have a mostly complete record of the area from about 110,000 years ago to the Holocene. The last 5,000 years are not from natural traps, they're from surrounding areas, but um, we, get, we get the same sort of signal. And here's what those data look like. Um, so we've got some cool, it's some cool um, trends here. So this is pine here, pine pollen. You can see there's a huge spike here at the end in pine pollen, right? Here's this um, little ground cover plant called Artemisia. Um, and we can see here um, that we have a really good Artemisia record. And then finally we have um, a Poaceae record, which is all grasses. So these are the grass records. Um, and from these pollen data, you might be like, what are we looking at here? It doesn't matter um, what the blips say right now for my talk, but we can actually use these blips and spikes to figure out what the climate was. So we can reconstruct climate from the pollen record. We can know um, approximately when the last glacial maximum was by the, by the uh, pollen record that we see and when the younger dryas was. So that, that cooling dip right, that I showed you on that first graph um, right before the extinction event. So we actually kind of know when these things happened because we have this base um, measurement down here which is coincident with an ash that we've dated. So we've got a date at the bottom and we can extrapolate from that what all these major events are. We're still discussing this, so we don't have a, a record set yet, but um, it can give us a really great climate record in the past because plants have very specific um, um, environments that they can live in. So this really allows us to correlate the climate record with the changes that we see in the megafauna, which is really, really amazing. I forgot to put that in. I actually didn't forget to put it in. My collaborator just never sent it to me. Um, so, finally at Natural Trap Cave, I'm going to talk about... Those are ray 
fan fishes. So these are basically like fish that live in fresh water. Uh, and our site is not really anywhere near fresh water. So how did the fish get in? Well, that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, this is what the inside of the cave looks like. So here's our um, trusty caver Juan. Um, he's actually coming out of the cave. You can see him doing a little frog motion. Up here on the ledge that he's about to pass is a pack rat nest. Um, here's what it looks like up close. And these pack rats have been living in this cave continuously for at least 40,000 years. So um, they have little colonies and they have been collecting all these little bones from all around the cave and they conglomerate them into their little nests um, and they pack it down and they pee on it and you know they make it so that it's really firm but then you know they can't control where everything goes so they're walking around their nest they kick fossils down so we have this basic rain of microfaunal fossils coming down underneath these pack rat nests in the cave that gives us a really lovely record of all the microfauna that's been in there basically the entire time the cave has been depositing animals. So thanks to these little cuties, we have a beautiful record. And um, this pack rat nest uh, hypothesis was actually postulated by um, a graduate student at the University of Kansas um, in the early 2000s. Um, this, was, this was actually not thought to be the, the type of deposition that was occurring with the microfauna by um, the Martin and Gilbert team in the 80s, they thought it was all being done by ravens. But ravens leave a very specific signature on the bones. Um, and that signature was not there for most of the microfauna. And just our observation, we basically noticed things falling out of the pack rat nest. So pack rat nest it is, the mode of deposit. Now where are the pack rats getting those things from? Well, some of them are probably collecting them from things that died naturally up at the surface. Um, but many of the bones that are in natural traps are actually um, detritus from different types of predators. So it turns out that breakage rates of bones of these little um, microfauna can actually discriminate the predator source. Um, and this is basically what uh, we decided to do at Natural Trap Cave from a study that was done by uh, Rebecca Terry long ago. Um, and what we find here is that here are the natural trap cave points. Um, here in red squares are um, mammal predators. So these are things like carnivores. Um, and carnivores really crunch up their bones. So bones are mostly broken uh, with carnivore, um, carnivore uh, scats. The other ones that we see here are owls and raptors. So owls and raptors um, are uh, have much more whole bones so they basically swallow their prey whole they digest them and then they excrete everything out in a little pellet so you get whole bones from owls and raptors and then um, here are ravens right here we only have one data point we wish we had better data points but here are our natural trap cave um, points and basically what we find is that really we've got a bunch of mammalian predators eating all these little things pooping them out and then the pack rats come and grab them, put them in their nest, and then they fall into our deposit. So thanks to um, mammalian predators and little pack rats, we have a beautiful microfaunal record at Natural Trap Cave. These guys are great too because unlike the big things, which can get up and move, if they don't like the weather, if it's nasty, they can just move, right? They can cover miles in a day. Whereas little things, they're just stuck there. They have to adapt or die, right? So. The ones that do best breed, put offspring into the next generation, and it's their signatures that we see through time. So when they change with the climate, we get a really good um, a view of that. And so we are going to use their little bones to basically tell us what the climate was like through time. And now we're embarking upon a new study um, looking at aridity in natural trap caves. So uh, when was it dry and when was it not so dry? And what are the changes that we see? in the small herbivores and the large herbivores as it gets dry and wet and dry and wet. So just to wrap up, a tale of two fossil sites. Um, I really love both of these sites. They're um, great for letting us know all about uh, change in climate, change in the environment, um, what we're seeing in response by the mammals. And they are different enough because some of the species overlap but what we know from these two sites is that 
This is an absolutely dry site. This is a very arid site, natural trap cave. We see a lot of arid species, lots of cursorial mammals or running mammals. Um, and at Rancho La Brea, we see a mix, right? We see some cursorial type mammals, but we also see some things like Smilodon, which is absolutely not cursorial. It needs some sort of cover to catch prey. So um, this site is going to give us one view of Pleistocene North America, and this site is going to give us another. But the lovely thing is that both sites have a fossil record that spans from 50,000 years to the recent. Um, exceptional fossil preservation and good climate proxies nearby, right? So Natural Trap Cave, we have all that uh, pollen data. Here at Rancho La Brea, some people are working on climate records and we have lots of good climate records from different lakes um, uh, in the region. And so uh, we could probably get a better record here, a more um, a localized record here. But both sites have a decent climate proxy. And the goal with both of these sites, for me and other members of my team, is to look at patterns of change through time in organisms and compare them to the climate record to see how they respond to climate changes, right? That's important for things that people are looking at today. Um, and, and figure out what the similarities and differences are between these two sites um, and how the changes are different or similar, right? So a big picture view of the end slice of is what I really want to get by looking at both of these things. So with that, I just want to thank um, the folks who have helped with this talk, all the members of the team of Natural Trap Cave, which are over here, all the Rancho La Brea folks, and a few others um, that have helped with different parts of this. And uh, I will leave you with this lovely photo of all of my Natural Trap Cave volunteers in the field. And I'm happy to take questions. I noticed that you said that the larger coyote uh, it resembles a lot like the wolf one. Um, what if it's a case of convergent evolution where the similar hunting styles may be caused the same structure and form? Right. So I think I think that's exactly what we're seeing. Um, I think that um, so different different dogs can have very different genetics um, and converge on the same morphology because they have that ability. They've got some plasticity in their in their body shape. And if they're doing the same thing, then yes, they will converge on that same morphology in order to uh, be the best they can be at, uh, at, at what they're doing. Yes? Uh, two questions. Yeah. One, how does the megafauna get in the cave? Yes. And secondly, why are, they, why are the bones all jumbled up like here in La Brea? That's a great question. Um, the, first an the first answer is easy. The second one is not so easy. Um, so the answer to the first question is that they fall in. Um, there is actually a little hill there right before you um, come up to the cave. And when you're walking, if you didn't have that grate there, you wouldn't see the hole. So I imagine, um, like I said, it's somewhat of a carnivore trap, and that's because uh, the likely scenario much of the time is that um, they were probably running, so carnivores were probably chasing prey. And both of them are kind of running for their lives, you know, either to save your life or to eat, eat dinner that night, right? And uh, they both go in. They don't notice that it's there. So that's that's how the megafauna end up in there. And when you when you weigh a good amount, and you fall 80 feet, you break and you die. Um, so they couldn't get out. Um, the second the second answer is a really good question, and that was one of the things that we're trying to figure out in that cave through um, taphonomy, right? Which is the process of decay and breakdown and fossilization from the time the animal dies until we find it as a fossil. So one of the things we're looking at actually is the sediment layers in the cave. They're uneven, so it kind of goes like this. It's a wavy pattern in the cave. Um, it's not a clear cut thing, so it's not like you could take out a big chunk and it would be the same all around. One of the things we think is happening um, is that the cave itself is made out of limestone and the cave was formed through a sinkhole. We think that there are multiple sinkholes that have formed in the cave throughout time that have fallen in and that have basically taken huge chunks of sediment with them. Mm -hmm. um, so we think that could be contributing to it. The cave also has um, a lot of water movement in it when it rains. So um, if animals were in there, things fell in, maybe the, they decayed and then you know there was some flooding after a rain or after a giant snow melt. 
um, it may have jumbled things around. But we don't have a clear answer. That's one of that's one of the mysteries of natural trap that we are trying to figure out. So all the things I mentioned are just hypotheses. They're not answers. Yeah. I know you addressed the dire wolf genome question, which is left over from last year. Yeah. But just to clarify, the impression I have from last year is that you pretty much had it, but it was embargoed. Yeah. Okay. It's it's submitted now to science. It may not actually. It went out for review, but it may not get published there. So. So I, c I can't give any more data. I mean, it will come out soon. You'll figure, we'll figure out what they are. Um, sort of like watch this space. Right, right. The preview, the preview, yeah. Um, you said that you guys aren't sure how like fish and stuff got into the cave. Mm -hmm. um, during the end of the Pleistocene, you know, the ice caps were melting. Is it possible that maybe a stream or something led into the cave? No. So, so what? So what we think is happening with the fish in the cave is that they are um, being brought over from carnivores. So basically, carnivores are catching fish. They're pooping them out by the cave, and then pack rats grab their their bones and bring them in. And they fall off. They fall off their nest. This is also related to the dire wolf, yeah. um, but is there anything you can say about hybridization? No, we don't know anything. I, I will say we don't know anything about hybridization. Um, that's not what we found. So, um, now, coyotes and wolves, eh, they could be hybridizing, and we don't know. Dogs are really weird. They're, they're crazy. <laughs> we don't know what they're doing. They do whatever they want to do. They don't tell us. No, yeah. Do we know just the, the exact origin of the coyotes? Did they branch off from wolves at some point, or where do they come from? So coyotes and wolves are sister groups. We know that from their from their DNA. Um, so there is some discussion of this in the Dire Wolf paper, and there's sort of some new um, hypotheses um, put forth. But um, uh, dogs in general evolved in in Eurasia, so they all came over to North America secondarily. So um, coyotes were here in the Pleistocene, obviously. We don't know if gray wolves were now. Um, they may not have been until the end of the, the Pleistocene, um, when the dire wolves went extinct, allowing them, you know, a, a new a new niche to fill. Would the dire would, would the wolves have they would have been here with the fox as one have been bigger than the other would when one chase the other off or just wait right. for one so die off? Right. So that's the thought is that just knowing what we know about dog behavior today. Um, it, it's highly plausible that dire wolves probably wouldn't suffer a gray wolf around, right? They're smaller, they're just like, I don't like you, I'm going to eat you and kill you, and that's that. So um, they're sort of, you know, dire wolves until the end of the ice age had a, had a, you know, a corner on the, on the dog market, to, you know, to say, in North America. So that's, that's one of the hypotheses about the dire wolf, gray wolf coexistence mm -hmm. theory hypothesis. Yes. That's a great question. Um, we have a guess. We know it goes down probably at least 100,000 years, um, but we haven't even gotten close to digging down that far. Um, the excavations that were done in the 70s and 80s by the teams from Kansas and, and Missouri did get down close to that. Um, they got down close to that level, uh, but they never made it. They never made it all the way down. And the rate that we're digging, we're never going to make it all the way down either. We'd have to basically get a backhoe in there and dig out all that infill that fell in. And the the BLM, the Bureau of Land Management, who runs the site, would never in a million years let us do that. So it won't it won't get done. Was there any water in those caves? Are the caves always dry? Was there any any water? There's water. There's water in them, and there's a lower chamber where there's flowing water sometimes. So there is water in them. Um, it does rain and snow melts in them and it drips off and there's actually a part of the cave where um, it's right underneath what we call the drop zone where all the fossils are completely saturated with water almost constantly. Um, they fall apart and they crumble and they're not very good for getting DNA out of them. You mentioned the impact, the younger driest impact. Is that except the university or some doubting it except for Yes and no about it. Is that pretty much accepted about the Younger Dryas impact or whatever that is? Well, we know that there was climate change during yeah. that, that time period. And, and all we're concerned about um, is was there a response to that climate change from the from the fauna. That's, that's one of the things we're looking at. Uh, yes. Help me. Maybe you said it's a wolf and a coyote. They could not mate. Their, their they can mate. Okay. So they can. 
then if they can, what's the difference between a wolf and a coyote? And where well, that's a great question. So the, the, the dog basically throws the uh, biological species concept right out the window, um, which basically says that, you know, things that are reproductively isolated yeah. are different species, right? Well, dogs and coyotes can mate. Um, coyotes and domestic dogs can mate. Wolves and coyotes can mate. Um, dogs are weird. <laughs> they just don't behave. So, um, so that's a great question. Um, are they, in fact, different enough? Coyotes and wolves, how we have genetic data from them, we can say how many millions of years um, they have evolved as separate species, um, or how many millions of years their genetic data is different. Can you sort of? Um, I, I don't know what the number is off the top of my head. Um, there are plenty of published papers out there on it. Um, but that's a great question, and I think the answer is none of us really can tell you exactly what a species is. Um, there's lots of different definitions of what a species is, and uh, that's just humans wanting to put everything in their own boxes. Um, nature doesn't care what a species is. Um, nature does what it wants. Yeah. You said that you guys were unsure if the gray wolves found in the uh, Canadian region, uh, they might not be gray wolves at all. What in, is, in Canada and, and Alaska, we know they are. Oh, we, have, but, we have DNA. Uh, the other reason, I'm sorry. Uh, what if those wolves are the result of hybridization from those coyotes and wolves mating, and they made some wolf-like animal that could have been area? So you mean, what What do you mean by coyotes and wolves mating? Well, um, in, in hybridization, you know, what if the offspring... Right, are you talking about gray wolves? Yes, okay. what if the offspring were coyote slash... So that, that could be the case at natural traps, because we don't have really good um, DNA yet. So we have mitochondrial DNA, which says they're coyotes. So it's possible that they are gray wolf coyote hybrids, so they have a gray wolf father and a coyote mother. Um, that is a possibility, because we haven't done their, their nuclear DNA yet, so we don't know that for sure. Um, the ones that are in Alaska and Canada, we know those are just wolves. Those are not hybrids. Um, so it is possible that we have some hybrids somewhere. Well, yeah. There is, uh, uh, this is probably something I read in Science Science Times a year or so ago, the DNA analysis that uh, said the eastern red wolf was not a wolf, but it was a coyote wolf hybrid mm -hmm. that started hybridizing with the arrival of the Europeans and wiping out every wolf in sight, which gave the coyotes an opportunity to come into that area. Yeah, so um, I would say that they probably didn't wipe out the wolves. I would say that wolves just interbred with them. Mm -hmm. um, so they basically wiped out the pure, pure wolves, right, in that area. Um, so yes, that's what they found. They found that the red wolves were um, a hybridization event of a coyote and a gray wolf, mm -hmm. right? Um, the implications for that are unclear, and uh, the data is what it is, right? The data is, is objective, but the response to that data is completely subjective, and there's been a huge debate um, in the conservation world about what to do with that data. Um, do they basically say, let's not save the red wolf because it's just a hybrid, or should we save the red wolf because it's a special thing? So that's sort of been a zone of contention in the conservation world since that data came out. Um, but yes, the data is, you're correct, the data is that red wolves are next minute they're having a romance. I don't know.